you know, the, the hadith is clear. Now we move on to the final uh, of the affairs of worship, which is another, another which is making, making an oath. Making an oath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and the proof for making an oath. Or what does it mean making an oath? First of all, what is the word another? What does it mean? Another means that when a person makes something obligatory upon himself, which is not actually obligatory. This is the meaning of making an oath. Right? Or he makes an act of worship which isn't wajib, then he makes it wajib upon himself. This is the meaning of another, to make an oath, to, to make something binding upon oneself. And the proof for this is, Allah says in the Quran, describing the believers, يُوفُونَ بِالنَّذْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا Allah describes the believers that they fulfill their oaths and they fear a day whose evil is widespread. So here Allah is describing a certain uh, the, the believers. And so he mentions another, that they fulfill their oaths. So another, what does it mean? It is when a man makes something obligatory upon himself, which has not been made obligatory upon him in terms of the religion. And this can be done in two ways. First of all, he can make an oath upon himself, which is not tied to anything. It's not restricted to anything. And in other cases, he can make an oath, in which case it is tied to something. So, so to explain what that means, the, fir the first example is when someone says, I will make it binding upon myself to fast three days. And that's it. It's not tied to anything. He's not tying it to anything. This is what we call the unrestricted oath. But in another situation, a person might say, if Allah cures my illness, or if Allah gives me success in my exams, then I will give charity. Or then I will fast three days. So here he, he is making an act of worship obligatory upon himself, but it's attached to a condition. This is what we call the restricted oath. Right? So, so the oath can be of two types. And each of these two types, the first one is praiseworthy, it is Mahmud to make an oath which is unrestricted, it is praiseworthy. And the second one, to make a restricted oath, meaning to tie to something like, for example, you know, oh Allah, if you cure me from this illness, which I can't bear anymore, then I will, I will, I will give, you know, a thousand pounds in charity. Right? This is makruh. This is disliked. And this is what is being referred to in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that indeed, and he's talking about the oath, that indeed, uh, that this type of oath doesn't bring about any goodness. Rather, all it does, it, it, it brings something out of the miserly person. This is, all this, uh, this is all it does. The oath, the oath, when a person makes this type of oath, really, he's being miserly with respect to ibadah. And he's saying basically, oh Allah, if you give me such and such, then I'll perform an act of worship. So it's a way of how some goodness is brought out of the miserly person. That's all it is. So it's makruh. This is makruh. To make a restricted type of type of oath. And so the Shaykh gives some examples. Again, he said, like when someone says, Oh Allah, you know, if you if you make easy for me marriage, or if you marry me to this, you know, uh, uh, lady or whatever, then I will perform hajj, then I will perform umrah. And then he mentions all these, you know, things. So this this is this is makruh, it is disliked. However, the Shaykh explains that irrespective of whether the oath is makruh or mamduh or praiseworthy, it is obligatory in both situations to fulfill the oath. Right? So in both situations to fulfill the oath is an act of ibadah. Whether you did something that is makruh, which is the restricted oath, or the unrestricted oath, to fulfill the oath is something which is wajib in both situations. And the Shaykh then mentions a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that whoever made an oath to obey Allah, then let him obey Allah. And whoever made an oath to disobey Allah, then let him not disobey Allah. So this proves that the fulfillment of an oath, once it has been made, 
it is wajib for you to fulfill that oath. It is wajib for you to fulfill that oath. And then the Shaykh goes on to explain that he raises an issue now which is how come if making an oath which is restricted is makruh, is makruh, then how has making an oath been considered to be from ibadah? This is a question that arises. How, how can something which contains an element of that which is makruh, how can it be considered to be from ibadah? And the Sheikh explains that basically uh, here, that when we, when we break it down and we look at, uh, the, there's four situations. The first situation is a person makes an unrestricted oath. He says, oh Allah, I make it binding upon myself that I will fast three days for you next month. Right, so he's made something which is not wajib, but wajib upon himself, but not attached to any conditions. This then is something praiseworthy, something good. This is the first situation. Second situation is that he makes an oath upon himself by making a restriction. Oh Allah, if you cure me from this illness, I will give a thousand pounds in charity. Right, so he's promised to do, made a binding upon himself to do a good deed, but the way he's done it is disliked, because it's it's like a miserly way of doing something which is is disliked. Okay, so so far we've got something which is mamdur and something which is disliked. <coughs> then when a person fulfills that oath, both this one and that one, there are two wajibs involved, two wajibs, two obligations involved. So the sheikh says that when we look at another. From this angle, we see that there are two wajibs, one, mamdu, one, one thing which is praiseworthy, but one thing which is blameworthy. So the Shaykh says that the scholars, when they look at the whole thing together, they see that overall, in most of the situations, there is goodness, there is khair in the issue of making, making, making an oath. And so for that reason, they include it to be from the uh, affairs of worship. And also because, obviously, most importantly, because a person when he makes an oath to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this then would be an instance of, this would be an instance of shirk. And then the shaykh goes on to explain, he says, uh, the shaykh goes on to uh, explain, first of all, someone who makes an oath for other than Allah. Like for example, you know, he says that, you know, he makes an oath to the person who is dead. Or he makes an oath to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or he makes an oath to Fatima radhiyallahu anha, or he makes uh, any oath to someone else. So he says, uh, for example, that upon me is to fulfill the oath which I made to so and so wali. Right. So he's making an oath to, to the wali now, not to Allah subhanahu wa taala. It's to, to to the wali that I have to fulfill the oath that I made to the wali. This is clearly an act of shirk to make the oath. And then if he was to fulfill the oath as well, that's another shirk on top of shirk. That's, that's another level of shirk on top of the shirk. And uh, an example of this, the shirk says, uh, this, is, this is one example, but an, an example of this would be when someone says that if Allah cures me of a certain disease, then I will have an oath, I will make an oath to such and such wali. So look at the situation now. Look at, look at the shirk here, because he's first of all saying the condition, if Allah cures me from my illness, which is rububiyya, so he's affirming rububiyya for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he says, if Allah cures me, I will make an oath to such and such wali, that I will do such and such. So for example, he will say that I, I, I make an oath to such and such wali, that I will donate, you know, uh, 500 pounds to this tomb, or even might be an act of worship, that I will, you know, do such and such. So look at how there's two parts here, the rububiyya, which is affirming for Allah, if Allah cures me, but the uluhiyya, he's directing it to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's making clear, clear, clear shirk. So this is another example of where this, this oath, you know, he, 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 he's making an oath whilst acknowledging Allah's rububiyya, but then directing the oath, the oath to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is purely from the angle, this is only the first stage which is making the oath. If he then went to fulfill the oath, that would be another shirk, on top of on top of the shirk and so this is you know this this is this is something that would involve the worship of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which, which is shirk so anyway uh, the shaykh then concludes he finishes and he says that in this in this in this verse Allah mentioned about the believers yufuna bin nadr that from their characteristics is that they fulfill their oaths and because he praised them 
then coming back to our principle that anything that Allah praises, any action that Allah praises, which the believers perform, it becomes an act of worship upon that rule that Allah only commands that which He loves and is pleased with, and therefore it enters into the definition of ibadah, and so therefore to make an oath to other than Allah, using all the other general verses in the Quran, it is a proof to show that it is haram to uh, direct you know, this act of worship to other than Allah. So that concludes our discussion of all of the affairs of worship, and I hope, inshallah,